Welcome to Morthal family this morning. We've got Brant and Stephanie, and the, we'll just go with the crew today. <clears throat> there are those of us that hear the scriptural command to be fruitful and multiply, and take that <laughs> figuratively, and there are others that take it more than literally, and this is one of those families, and we are very blessed uh, to have this family in our church congregation, and this is little Austin. Do we, do we dare try? It's been a minute. Okay. We're going to face you this way because I'm wearing a white shirt today, so I've learned that one. Would you guys stand this morning as we pray and bless this family today that God would continue to bless you guys and give you wisdom and patience and all the things necessary to raise children in this day. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for this family and we thank you that uh, through them and through their union and through their love, uh, all these lives have been brought into the world. And so Lord Jesus, we ask that you would bless them that you would give them everything that they need for life and godliness. And this morning, Lord Jesus, we pray for Austin. We pray your richest blessing on him, that he would be united to you through faith at the earliest possible age, that he would be filled with your spirit. Lord Jesus, that he would be used mightily in your kingdom. And so we pray for his siblings, that they would take the privilege and the honor of being an older uh, sibling seriously, that they would set the example of, of faith, hope, and love. And so may this family unit continue to grow in wisdom and stature and strength and all the things uh, that you have called them to in life. And we ask this as their church family in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. Well, blessings on you guys. Whew, I still got it. <laughs> okay. Why don't you guys take a few minutes, say hello to someone around you, and then we will enter back in in a few minutes.
Good morning, everyone. Go ahead and find your seats, please. This morning, before we enter into a time of worship, through song, through meditation on the Word of God, and through prayer, I want us to take a minute to consider what is currently on your heart and mind this morning. So is it the tasks that you have to do later today? Maybe it's the fight that you had in the car on the way here. Maybe it's something that happened in current events this week. Maybe you're feeling a little heavy with your own personal brokenness this morning. When we come to gather with one another on a Sunday morning, we aren't gathering in order to minimize the things that are filling our hearts and our minds, but we do seek to put them into perspective. And what better way to do that than to reorient our hearts and our minds on the beauty of Christ? the one who is making all things new. In order to do that, to start us in that process, I'm just going to read Psalm 27, verses 4 through 6, which is where I go when I need my heart and mind reoriented a little bit. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent shouts, sorry, sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. So why don't you join us this morning, stand, and we can do that together. Good morning. Uh, this first song is going to be one that a lot of you probably don't know the melody of. The words are just Psalm 134. And it's to call for God's people to stand and worship him. And so even if, you know, take a second to catch on the melody, just let the words wash over you and join me in singing to the Lord this morning. Come, bless the Lord.
so so kind you have been so so kind to me oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God oh it chases me down and fights till I'm found leaves the 99 I could Earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. When I was your foe. Now is your fault to you love far from me. You have been so, so good to me. And I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so So, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found to be the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, and I won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, I won't tear down coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love. Of God, oh, it chases 
me down, fight till I'm found, leaves in 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone is solid ground, firm for the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. Fears are still in striving seas. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone. Who took on flesh, fullness of God in a helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on the cross that Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Every sin. Was laid here in the death of Christ. I live. There in the ground, there in the ground, his body lay, light of the world in our darkness slain, that bursting forth. His glorious day, up from the grave He rose again. And as He stands in victory, truth has lost its grip on me. And as He stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, Mine brought with the precious blood of Christ. Not again, I am his, for I am his. He is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life. No fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no schemes of man can ever block me from his hand. No power of hell. From his hand, till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Oh, 
Hallelujah, I shall not be moved. Anchored in Jehovah, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water, I shall not be moved. Can I say glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved. Anchored in Jehovah. Like a tree that's planted by the water, I shall not be moved. In his love abiding, in his love abiding, I shall not be moved. And in him confiding, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. It's like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be Though all hell is still me, I shall not be moved. Jesus will not fail me, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be. I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. Though all hell assail me, I shall not be moved. Jesus will not fail me. I shall not be moved just like a tree. Planted by the water, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. Thank you, Jesus. We praise your name this morning. We just thank you very much for being here. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. My name is Billy Haig. I'm an associate pastor here. If you are visiting or it's your first time here, uh, we're glad that you're here. Um, before we get to communion, normally at this part of the service, we have some sort of ministry moment, uh, something about the neighborhood, and we don't normally do that on the same morning as communion. But uh, I got an email and a text message just this week from the principals at Oakdale. And tomorrow, sorry, not tomorrow, Tuesday night, June 4th at 6 o'clock, Oakdale Middle School is having their end of the year award ceremony. And they want to recognize RVF as their community volunteer award this year, which is really cool. Um, and they invited any of us who have been involved at Oakdale that want to go. We can go to the award ceremony. It's just in their auditorium across the street there, 6 o'clock Tuesday night. I will be there. Would love to have you there. If you've worked at all with Oakdale this year, if you've prayed for Oakdale, if you've hoped good things for Oakdale, um, <laughs> good job. But for real, thank you for your help. It isn't often 
Uh, I think the kingdom of, of heaven, the kingdom of God is a subtle thing, isn't it? And sometimes we can work for years and years and not know what impact is happening. And every once in a while, you get a glimpse that something positive is going on. And if at the, the very least, what has happened this year is we have built some trust and we've earned gratitude from the school. And that is a great starting point. Uh, so we praise God for those things. And if you want to come and be a part of the award ceremony on Tuesday night at 6 p.m., we'd love to have you there. But thanks so much for partnering in that ministry. Um, you guys showed up the first week of school and chased middle schoolers around the halls and opened their lockers for them. Uh, you've provided meals uh, and snacks for teachers on in-service days. I think you've been praying. I'm sure some of you have. Um, and I'm really grateful for all of that. And then for those of us that actually get paid to do this kind of thing, we got to be there at least once a week throughout the entire school year. And, and most of the time, we just made sure kids weren't too crazy at lunch. Um, but in the midst of all that was a lot of relationship building and trust building. So thank you. God bless you. I do think the spirit is at work, and I'm excited to see what the future may hold in our relationship with Oakdale. All right. Uh, well, this morning, we have the opportunity to come to the Lord's table. And this is a time for us to tangibly experience the presence of Christ as we remember his death and participate in his life with him. At this table, we eat and drink so that we might be nourished with the life of Christ. It is in Jesus that we find life, forgiveness, hope, and unity. In John chapter 6, verses 53 through 58, it says this, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever." That's equal parts beautiful and strange, isn't it? In fact, when Jesus told this to the people following him, lots of people decided they were done, like they left at that point. And then he asked his disciples, he said, well, what about you? Are you going to turn away as well? And they responded and said, well, where else are we going to go? You have the words of life. And I don't know about you and your journey of faith, but for me, oftentimes, that is what the life of faith has felt like. There are all sorts of questions and difficulties and problems in the world that sometimes it doesn't feel like our faith speaks to. But at the very core of it, Jesus captures us with who he is and with his beauty. And so even though there's lots of questions and, and difficulties, where else will we go? Because it is only in Christ that we find life. In the blood of Christ, we find forgiveness. He took a cup, and when he had give, given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So we find at this table life. We find at this table forgiveness, but we also find hope, because the Apostle Paul tells us that as we take communion, we proclaim Christ's death until he returns. And it is also here at this table that we find unity with one another. It is in the life and death of Jesus and our faith in him that makes all of us one as we are united to Christ. So as we eat this morning, we are once again nourished by the life of Christ. And as we drink, we see once again our forgiveness for all of our sin. We celebrate that his death was not the last work of God but we wait eagerly for his return. And we together as one participate in the body and blood of Christ. And so if you are here this morning and you are a follower of Jesus, you know him and you have faith in him, you come to this table. You come for life, you come for forgiveness, you come for hope and you come for the unity that we share in him. But if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, you're not a follower of him, we ask that you don't partake in this this morning. 
This is a meal for those who know Jesus. And that is not to say you're not wanted here. If you are here and don't know Jesus, and this is something you want to participate in, the table is open for any who believe. And we implore you to come to Jesus. Place your faith in him. Trust him. There is space for you at the table right alongside of us. So I'm just going to pray and ask God's blessing on communion, and then we will eat together and drink together. Heavenly Father, we come together before this table in gratitude that you would send your son for us. Jesus, we are grateful for your sacrifice. We are grateful for your resurrection. We are grateful for your eventual return. And we are grateful that your spirit is present here with us. And so as we take this morning, we're grateful for our forgiveness and for our life that we have in you. And we ask that you would be honored in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take this bread and eat it. It is the body of Christ broken for you. And now, take this cup and drink it. It is the cup of the new covenant in Christ's blood for the forgiveness of sins. Now, if you'd stand with me, I'm going to read this morning's scripture, and then I will pray for and dismiss the kids who are in here still. Our text this morning is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. This is the word of the Lord. And now will you pray with me over our third through fifth graders who joined us for communion. Jesus, we thank you so much for the young people in our church, um, not just for the third through fifth graders in this room, but uh, the younger ones who are already in class. We are grateful, God, for your grace on them that they get the opportunity to be raised in you. And we pray that the truth of the gospel would take root in their hearts from a young age, that they would know that they are loved by you, that they are safe with you, and we pray, God, that they would choose to love you and follow you with their life. We ask for their teachers, that you would bless them as they attempt to communicate the gospel truth to these kids. We pray that they would be effective in that work and that they would find joy in it. So we thank you and we praise you in your name. Amen. All right, kiddos, you can head out to class if you haven't already done so. Maybe they already did. And with that, we're going to enter back into worship.
to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. You guys may be seated this morning. For those of you who don't know, this is Koi. Uh, Koi is a member at the Story in Ashland and one of uh, has been one of my students at the Bible College. A recent graduate, correct? That's correct. Correct of Pacific Bible College. <clears throat> um, and I saw his set list this morning. And any time the name Johnny Cash arrives on a set list at worship, <laughs> you know I'm going to be pretty stoked about that. So. Uh, the Johnny Cash version of I Shall Not Be Moved. Dig that. So, Koi, thank you for, for lean worship for us this morning. Um, graduation weekend. I wanted to recognize any uh, of our high school graduates that are here this morning that graduated. If you, my daughter was here. Ava, are you the only one else that's here? Nope, there we If you would stand, if you're a graduate. There we go. There we go. Sammy, hey. Awesome. <laughs> You guys may be seated. I have no presents or pieces of candy to toss at you, but uh, as your church family, we did want to recognize uh, it's a major milestone uh, to graduate from high school, and so in many ways, it's the end of one chapter, but the beginning of uh, the longest part of your life, which is adulthood, and so welcome to the party. Um, we, uh, we want you to know, and we, we pray, and we trust, and hope that uh, you guys have found RVF to be a place of family and community, and that as you navigate life, um, we hope that this is a place of stability and love and mercy and grace for you. So as your parents and, and grandparents and aunts and uncles and just older people in your life that are journeying with Jesus, uh, may you continue to journey with us as we uh, walk with him and you guys discover what it means uh, to walk with him in your adult life. So congratulations again. My daughter just snuck out because we have a party and it's supposed to rain and we had set out a bunch of stuff in the backyard. So she's zipping out there to try to figure something else out with her mom. So that's where my head is at. We have family in town. Uh, and I, I think, what is there, 16, 17 of us at the, at the house? Something to that effect. I don't know. A lot of people staying at my house. I rented a trailer, uh, or my parents rented a trailer, parked it at the church. Sorry, I didn't pay for your trailer. God forbid, <laughs> Olivia. <laughs> it's my little sister. Um, <clears throat> your brother and I have only fed you all week. Um, so, sorry, we're just going to work out some family things <laughs> right here in front of everybody. Um, I, my dad and I went to get coffee this morning, which I've told you guys, every Sunday I call my dad, um, and we talk about our sermons, uh, but today we were in the car driving to get our coffee, and we pull into Starbucks, and he goes, oh, what are you teaching today? And I go, I haven't thought about my sermon since Wednesday when I finished it, because I knew I had to finish my sermon before everybody got here, and I go, oh, it's Second Thessalonians, so that's where we'll be today, so if you have your Bible... Turn to 2 Thessalonians. Uh, very excited to be in this book. It's a shorter book, only three chapters. And so we will, after a number of weeks, if you've been with us over the last few weeks, uh, we had Ascension Sunday, we had Pentecost Sunday, and then we had Mission Sunday. So three Sundays in a row where we have been out of our regular series that we have 
tackled in 2024, which is Through the Bible, um, a book a week, that 30,000-foot flyover, this year being uh, predominantly in the New Testament. And so we will continue that this morning, and we will continue that throughout the summer, just so you know. So while I'm on sabbatical, um, the, the staff and the teachers will just continue this series, and you guys will actually wrap up the New Testament before I get back. And so we'll have a new series uh, in the fall when I return. But this morning, we will be in 2 Thessalonians. So just, uh, again, a reminder for us, because obviously 2 Thessalonians is somewhat connected to 1 Thessalonians, um, both in terms of its author. Anybody want to guess? Paul. Yeah, so I couldn't say sounds like a squirrel because the answer is not Jesus today. So the answer is Paul. Paul wrote the book, um, and he wrote the book somewhere between 50 and 51 AD, most likely from the city of Corinth uh, after uh, writing 1 Thessalonians, although there is some debate among scholars as to which Thessalonians should come first in the order, which one he wrote first. Church history has predominantly landed, obviously, on the order that we hold this morning. But it's written to a church uh, that was planted um, by the Apostle Paul, kind of under some dire circumstances. Uh, the city itself, because remember, these letters are written to a particular context. They're written to a particular group of people that have their own cultural moment. And a lot of the things that we read, Paul doesn't always explicitly lay out. Here's what it meant to live in the city of Thessalonica. Here was the challenges. Here was the problem. He's a pastor jumping in, dealing with things, boots on the ground, tyranny of the urgent, putting out fires left and right, relational fires, theological fires. And so he's just writing a letter that has been passed down to us. And so this morning we hold this letter and many of us have read it most of our life um, or much of our life. And so it's good for us to, to know what was it like to be a first century Christian um, in this city, in this time and place. Well, Thessalonica, as we've said before, was located on the Aegean Sea and was a large port city, um, similar to Corinth and Ephesus, and it was part of the Roman Empire. It had served as the capital of, for the Roman Empire of the province of Macedonia and had a population of roughly 200,000. So for that day, this is a pretty, it's a mega city. It's, it's, a, it's a large city within the Roman Empire. Um, it had given and, and exhibited extreme loyalty to the Roman Empire and specifically the emperors themselves. And so they were what was called a free city, that for the most part they were able to function and operate um, the way they wanted to without a lot of interference from Rome and the leadership of Rome, as long as, as, long as they continued to give ultimate allegiance and undying loyalty to the emperor and his vision for the Roman Empire, they were allowed to pretty much operate the way they wanted to. And that sort of allegiance and that sort of loyalty was actually what they called the cult of the emperor. It was actually a form of worship where they worshiped the emperors as sorts of gods. And so that was kind of Rome's stipulation. Hey, as long as you pledge allegiance to us, as long as you give us your loyalty, Caesar, as long as you worship me as a god, you can have a lot of other gods, but you also have to include me in that pantheon of gods. And so what happens is Paul comes and he preaches a different gospel. He preaches a gospel that there aren't multiple gods and there's not multiple kings. There's actually one god and one true king. And you can read about that story in Acts chapter 17. But the city itself was a very mixed bag, as I said, of religion. And so to attack the, the cult of the emperor... Uh, by proclaiming the exclusive claims of another deity, was virtually to attack the city itself, and in such an environment to preach Christianity. Not a blended version where you could like Im incorporate parts of Ro the, the empire and Rome and Christianity, but to, to proclaim the gospel of exclusive loyalty to King Jesus, to the city of Thessalonica was actually tantamount to treason. And so Paul comes, he, he preaches the gospel in Acts chapter 17, and the city leaders take exception to this. They're upset by this. And the, what they say is that he's actually preaching another king. When you read it in Acts 17, what they say is he's preaching another king than Caesar. And we can't have that. We can't have him preaching about another king than Caesar. 
And so the church is founded. Some people give their life to Jesus. It's a small group. But the leadership of this early church, it's, he's only there for a few weeks. He's not there for months and years. Like He spent three years in Ephesus. So he really builds relationship. The church has a chance to grow. He's here just a handful of weeks. And all of a sudden, the leadership says, hey, Paul, we think you need to like get out of here. Otherwise, you're going to be arrested and possibly killed. And so kind of in the middle of the night, Paul gets away and he leaves. Well, again, Paul had formed these relationships with these brothers and sisters in the Lord. And he has deep concern for them about their faith. Will their faith stand up to the trial and the pressure cooker of persecution? Will it stand up to the trial and pressure cooker of being ostracized for their faith? How will this young church respond to the situation that Paul was forced to leave them in? And so he, he sends Timothy to check, and, and Timothy comes back and says, hey, they're, they're, they're still walking with the Lord. And so he writes 1 Thessalonians, and that's what we looked at a number of weeks ago. And within that letter, you'll remember that Paul expressed gratitude for their um, conversion and their perseverance. Paul was grateful that they had come to know the Lord and that they had persevered in their faith. And we were reminded that, that, that part of walking with Jesus and part of trusting God often is trusting the people we love the most with him when we can't be there for them. You remember that? Where there's times that we can't be with everybody. There's times that we may have a wayward kid or, or a family member, and, 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 and it's like, I, I want to be there. I need to know how they are. And we can't, providentially, we, we can't get there. And it's this opportunity to trust the goodness, the sovereignty, the faithfulness, the kindness, the compassion, and ultimately the work of the Spirit in the life of conversion and the perseverance in the faith. He also wrote in 1 Thessalonians to give the guidance to the church. And you'll remember that he gave them guidance into relation, in relation to holiness, where he talked about sexuality and how Christians were to behave faithfully to Jesus, that Jesus has a particular sexual ethic, and part of walking with him is a faithfulness to that. That he, um, that he gave them guidance in relation to love for one another, and then he gave them guidance in relation to their future hope that future hope being seen as the return of Jesus. And so that was 1 Thessalonians. Well, now this morning we come to 2 Thessalonians. And what we see and what scholars believe is that this letter was probably written within a year of the first letter. So it's still a relatively short period of time. These are some of the earliest letters that the Apostle Paul wrote. But what is clear is that persecution, that pressure cooker has seemed to have gotten worse for the church. And they had become confused and scared in regards to the return of Jesus. So there was the continued pressure culturally, and then there was this theological worldview or opinion that was coming into the church that was teaching them that Jesus had already returned. And they were unsure about this, and it was creating all sorts of anxiety within the life of this church. And so to that end, Paul will write another letter. And that's the letter that we'll look at this week as a congregation. And that, Lord willing, you will read. First, uh, or Second Thessalonians just has three chapters. It can probably be read in less than 15 minutes. But he writes another letter to do three things, and we'll look at these briefly. Number one, to commend their faithfulness. This church continues to remain faithful to Jesus in the midst of opposition. They continue to endure hardship. And in many ways, 2 Thessalonians is a letter about endurance, continuing on in the way. How many of you could use a little endurance right now in your season of life? Two of us, cool. There was about 100 heads that nodded, and two people were, yes, me. Uh, we'll start a small group. Um, we'll call it Endurance, and we'll go through a 12-week study. Uh, <clears throat> kidding. We won't do that. We'll read 2 Thessalonians this week and see what God has to say to us. So it commends their faithfulness. Number two, he gives clarity about Jesus' return. The irony is that for us 2,000 years later, there's still a lot of unclarity <laughs> about Jesus' return, particularly as we try to interpret the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians. So in Paul's attempt to bring clarity to this church, we maybe remain a little more confused. 
Uh, number three, he challenges them toward continued growth. And that continued growth is connected to his first letter where he exhorts Christians not to be idle, but to work. And so he revisits that, that challenge to continue to grow, and he puts a little more teeth in it this time, so to speak. So let's look at those three things, commending their faithfulness, clarity about Jesus' return, and then their challenge to growth. Chapter 1, 2, and 3. So in chapter 1, as I said, he commends their faithfulness. We see this right off the bat as you'll read. He says, therefore, he says, therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God. What would we want to be known for as a church? I think it's awesome. that we. What was the specific award? Community Oh, I put you on the spot. Community service of some partner. Community service partner. So, so part of what RVF, sure, that sounds cool. Um, we don't do it for the awards, right? Yes. Um, part of what RVF is being known for in our community, and particularly our neighborhood, is this ability, this willingness to be present, to just show up regularly, whether that's we show up for wrangling junior hires in the hall, whether that's we show up to help kids get across the crosswalk. If you've ever want to see Billy in a neon bright shirt, come by about three o'clock on Wednesday usually. He's out there, Officer Billy, directing traffic. It's quite a scene to see. Um, but what we're known for, so you think about reputation. Well, this church had a reputation. And what was Paul proud of? He said, hey, I boast about your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you were enduring. That this church, in the midst of their affliction and opposition, is known for their steadfastness and faith in Jesus. Jesus. 